Well, thanks very much for having me today. I appreciate it. I uh, always like to start my talks out when I'm speaking to a group I haven't addressed before by finding out who I'm talking to. Uh, so don't be embarrassed about this. I want to see who in the room is 100% organic as a farmer or a gardener or whatever you do. 100%. All right, we have a few. Great. How many of you use a little bit of organics and a little bit of chemicals still? All right, how many of you are still listening to the wrong radio station? <laughs> I see I'm talking to polluters and environmental thugs today. <laughs> well, that's, that's fine. Um, after hearing me, I'm sure you will all uh, convert uh, as... We uh, always do. We have uh, free handouts, and I've, I've got them up here on the, uh, on the table for you. If you don't uh, have a copy, take one of those when you leave. If you don't get one today, you can get it off the website. Uh, it's always there for you. And it's something we give out for free because it tells the basic steps of being an organic person versus using the things that we don't recommend. People often wonder, and by the way, Jim, I'm sorry, but I don't have slides today. We had a little miscommunication plus the time uh, limit. We're not, uh, uh, it's really better that I tell you what I'm going to tell you today and then allow as many questions as possible. Next time we get together, we'll bring the slides. But a lot of people wonder how I got into this, and I got into it when my daughter was born in 1985. Logan, who is also the announcer on my show, if you've heard the show, she uh, was born uh, in 85. She started moving around pretty quickly. At about nine months old, she walked and she crawled all over the place, and she did what kids do. She picked up everything she saw and she stuck it in her mouth. At that point in time, I had no idea what organic gardening was, 1985. So I'm a born-again organic gardener, and the education started then. I made a call to a friend of mine, Bill Knoop at Texas A&M, had lunch with him, asked him, about this organic thing. He said, it's nonsense, Howard, forget it, it'll never work. <laughs> so I said, fine. And by the way, I'm writing, and we're still friends, I'm writing a book on turf with uh, Bill right now, but Bill tried to get me to forget about it. I didn't give up. I asked some other people, I met some farmers and some ranchers, uh, in particular Malcolm Beck in San Antonio, and Malcolm and other people taught me how to do an organic approach on a large scale, farming and ranching primarily. Well, it made sense to me. I bought it hook, line, and sinker the minute they explained to me that you simply stop using toxic materials, you start using compost and manure-based products and rock powders, mulching the soil, planting adapted plants, and it just made perfect sense. So I was off and running uh, at that point, and then I realized something really interesting. When you converted from farming information over to gardening, it was a lot easier. One of the first projects I converted was Frito-Lay's national headquarters in, in uh, Plano. It, at the time I designed it, it was 175 acres designed the landscaping. And uh, for between 19, uh, 1980 and 1989, it was under a chemical, typical uh, chemical fertilizer and pesticide program. From 89 till today, it has been under a 100% organic program. It's 300 acres now. And it and Johnson & Johnson, up until the time they sold and moved to Malaysia to make their gloves and a church took over the property, it was also under my organic program. Also now the Saver Corporation in South Lake is under a 100% organic program. Iskar Metals is. The list is, is growing. It's growing slower than I would like for it to grow, but it is growing. And the main reason is that these people are slowly learning that it works better. The people that are in farming and ranching that have gotten into this approach have made more money. They have been more successful at keeping their property. And we're showing the same thing to the people at home. The most interesting statistic of all is that when I started talking about organics on my radio show at WBAP and writing about it in the column, which both started the same year, 1989, and I am on Channel 8 now doing a little segment every Friday, Saturday, Saturday and Monday. And, and all those things have helped. But when we started, there was not one retail store in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that sold everything that I talked about. It sold a, a complete uh, arsenal of organic products, from compost to organic fertilizers to organic pest control products. 
Today, in my listening uh, area, and it's a big one, WBAP's 50,000 watts booms out there pretty, pretty far. But today, we have over 500 stores that sell everything that we talk about. And we have about 50 of them that are 100% organic. They don't sell one single uh, synthetic fertilizer. They don't sell one single uh, toxic pesticide in the store. That doesn't happen in California. It doesn't happen in Vermont. It doesn't happen in Colorado. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the United States. In fact, one of the most common emails that I get from people from other parts of the country is, Howard, I lived in Fort Worth. And I've been under your program for about five years, and I've moved to Colorado now, and I need some help. I can't find any of the things that you talk about. There, no, none of these people understand organics. What am I going to do? Well, that's our next step at converting the world, is to, <laughs> is to reproduce the model that we have created in the Dallas-Fort Worth area to other cities. Going back to Free Tail Life for just a second, it, after I'd been doing the Free Tail Life project, uh, consulting with them on this organic approach for about, I guess, three or four years, and the same thing happened at Johnson & Johnson. There was one guy, one fellow in both companies that went into the um, management and said, you know, we're worried about our stock price, we're worried about laying off people, we are laying off people, we're trying to cut costs. Why in the world are we doing this stupid organic program maintaining the grounds? They both assumed that it was costing more money. And I uh, said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's do an audit. What it used to cost and what it's costing now and what it would cost to go back to a chemical approach. Both of those guys became my two biggest fans once they saw the, uh, the numbers. And that's why we've been able to keep those things around so much. I've been very disappointed that I haven't been able to get the rest of the landscape industry into what I'm talking about. The nursery industry is into it greatly. You've got some great places here in, in Fort Worth. Marshall Grain Company is, is not 100% organic. They're not in that 100% category. But they're all, they are in the wholesale distribution category. They've helped me greatly at, at getting the products out to all of the stores. There are several that are 100% organic. Weston Garden in Bloom is one. Redenta's Gardens uh, spread across the Metroplex is 100% organic. All the others are, are listed. I won't go through them, but they're listed on, on my website as well. The, uh, the thing that's the most fun about all the things I recommend is one particular product. And I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about it because it's, it's, it's fun. And then we'll take some questions. But of all the questions that I get every day, the most fascinating has been related to cornmeal. Now, if you've listened to me talk about cornmeal, you already know what I'm going to talk about here. But here's how it all started. I had learned that uh, corn gluten meal was a, uh, a natural weed and feed fertilizer. And I learned that from a fellow at Iowa State. Dr. Nick Christians and his staff stumbled into the fact that if you put out corn gluten meal in the spring and in the fall, it was a wonderful organic fertilizer, very, very powerful, about a 911 ratio, but it also worked as a natural uh, pre-emergent herbicide. And they put the thing on the market. They patented the natural use of it, which I don't like at all. I'd normally tell people to buy the generic stuff. But it was a major step at getting uh, an organic product on the market that had university research behind it. Well, after that, we started playing with regular cornmeal, and we, we discovered something very important. And, and really, it was an A&M researcher that gave me the first clue on it. In fact, I was speaking in Stephenville one day to a, a little event, a little herb event that happens every year. And we were in this little church in the in a small park that had these old buildings, and the church is where we were speaking. It's the only time I'm ever in church anymore since my show is uh, all morning on Sundays these days. But I was, I was waxing eloquent about not using toxic chemicals and that A&M wasn't pushing that sort of thing, and there was no university. I pick on A&M the most because they're the most visible, but I went to tech, and they're not any better, so I'm not... <laughs> 